welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your host for Commission Ed. All right, Reed, this is a very interesting episode, I think, that we are going to share with the audience. Very different, I think, from what we've done in the past. I mean, we've talked about culture and how important it is, but I don't think we've really taken it head on like we do in this episode and the interview with Lieutenant Colonel Nick Jerwitz. Yeah. When you proposed this topic, I was really curious, like what (laughs) spurred it and why, but I got to tell you, and we'll get to this on the back end. I really had some thinking to do after this. Um, You know, not only do some of these stories make me super happy and get me all excited to be an airman, but some of them really make me wonder about my own culture. And yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. Great interview with, uh, Colonel Jerwitz Spike. We really appreciate him uh, coming on, taking the time to share his thoughts, his experiences, and some of these really fantastic stories. So with that, let's turn it over to Spike and hear what he has to say. Lieutenant Colonel Nicholas Jerwitz. Did I get that right? You did. I you did. did. Yeah, I did. You, okay. So I can be taught. Welcome to the podcast. It's an awesome experience to have you here. And if I understand correctly, you go by Spike, right? That's your call sign? That is correct. And first, thanks for having me on. This is awesome. First one of these I've done. So pretty cool. And yep, go by Spike. Used to have spiky hair, don't anymore. And that is the quick and skinny of the story. But fitting call sign, I guess. Yeah, I'm sure that if somebody comes across you in a bar and wants to buy you a drink, they'll get the full story, right? Absolutely. A drink, maybe a few. (laughs) We'll see. But yeah, they get the full story that way. If they buy you a few, maybe they'll get more than the full story that, <laughs> you know, the embellished version. But uh, that actually brings us to why we're here today. We want to talk about fighter culture, how things operate within the fighter squadron. And call signs is one of those things, but it's not the only thing. But before we get into any of that, let's give you the opportunity to introduce yourself to the audience, give them an idea of who you are, where you come from, how you got into the Air Force, what you're doing now, what the future holds, and then we'll get more into what it's like serving in a a fighter squadron. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks for the chance to talk a little bit about just the background and everything. And my flying career has been fairly normal, I would say, but uh, getting into it was maybe a a little bit unique. So I'm actually second generation Air Force. Uh, My dad actually flew for the Air Force as well. So he flew F-111s and F-15As, which is is pretty neat. I'm currently stationed at Mountain Home Air Force Base. This is the fifth time I've lived here because my dad was stationed here three times growing up. Uh, So it's kind of been (laughs) fun to, to follow in his footsteps in so many ways, shapes and forms. But I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 2005 and then went off to grad school for a year. Uh, so I okay. got a master's degree in philosophy out of Virginia Tech, uh, which was wow. a great experience, uh, good social education. Really helpful for flying the jet. Yeah, very helpful. I was kind of surprised they sent me there, but it's actually been very helpful and we'll talk about ways a little bit later. Okay. And then went to Euronado Joint Jet Pilot Training, so in jet out at Shepard, yeah. followed by selection for the F-15E training at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base for the basic course. Uh, and then kind of like I alluded to, Mountain Home Air Force Base for my first operational assignment. So. I was with the 391st Fighter Squadron, deployed twice with the Tigers, volunteered, deployed once with the T-Bolts, a sister squadron on base. So three deployments in three years was pretty busy. Yeah. And then went out to the B course to be an instructor at Seymour Johnson following that. And then okay. this is where my career kind of diverges a little bit. I did two years on staff out at, uh, at the time, PACOM uh, in Hawaii. So that was not a bad deal. Right. Followed by, <laughs> I mean, you were on staff. <laughs> Staff in Hawaii, it was paradise. What can I say? Uh, (laughs) Definitely, you know, nice temperatures compared to the 20 degrees we have right now in Idaho. There you go. And then school at Georgetown University for a year and then back to Mountain Home now. So two years with the 389th Fighter Squadron, U.S. Squadron. And then I've been with a very unique form military sales squadron, U.S. Singapore Partnership Squadron for the last year and a half. So that's kind of my career up to this point. 
like I said, some of the flying stuff, probably fairly normal. Some of the non-flying stuff, maybe a little bit off the beaten path and, and a little bit different, but unique. Okay. So you are a fighter pilot. You've been in fighter squadrons almost your entire career. You have a degree in philosophy, so maybe you can use that to help us parse out this whole idea of what is the fighter squadron, the culture that goes into it. But before we even get there, like let's try to understand where did the fighter squadron come from to begin with? Because, you know, we all know Wilbur and Oval Wright, they made man-powered flight possible. And obviously the military saw instant application there originally for, you know, surveillance purposes. But once one of those pilots took a pistol up into the air with him, he became a, a fighter pilot, right? But what happened between then at the beginning of the 20th century to now to create what we now know as the fighter squadron? Yeah, I think that's a really good question and pretty deep question, because like you said at the very beginning, you know, it was nascent, it was new, there wasn't a whole lot to build on, it had to be created. And so whether you're talking about the military application, civilian application, and with the civilian application, I think it's worth thinking about, like, it was a blurred line there as people tried to develop what aviation was going to be, in the sense that you had military aviators who were also doing things like air races and air mail and a bunch of things like that, that were all, whether military or civilian, very high risk endeavors. And so then you take that and the, the folks who were participating there who fought in World War One, and I would say, you know, vastly and starkly different from what we do now as far as what the squadron was. But as we'll find as I kind of keep talking about it and building it out, a lot of it has to do with the risk you inherently take on by pursuing something like this, by yeah. being airborne. And that started certainly early on in those early days as well. Sure. And so I think that was a little bit of a foundational piece to it. And then I think where it really started to take shape was in World War II. And obviously, you know, the development of the technology, it's been around for now, you know, numerous decades. Uh, it's starting to evolve. And then just so much more of that aerial combat is being a pivotal piece. So now you're amplifying that risk. It's becoming a more fundamental part of conflict and fighting a war. And then uh, I would say the cultural aspect of it really took on between Korean War and Vietnam War, yeah. especially when you start thinking back to a Robin Olds with, you know, how he uh, documented it in his autobiography and everything like that. And he flew in both of those conflicts. And I think that's where it started to coalesce from, yeah. you know, individuals, a lot of personality driven, trying to figure their way out of what this thing is supposed to be, thing being the aircraft and what we're supposed to do with it, but as well, also the cultural and organizational piece to now, you know, many decades, half a century worth of doing it. And it starts to, like I said, coalesce, obviously shaped by the conflicts along the way in the particular timeframes. But I would say post-Vietnam is where you start to have what looks to be a whole lot like the fighter squadron that you have today, as far as culture goes and organization. Yeah. And maybe to help us understand a little bit more of how we get a fighter squadron, we should understand a little bit more who the fighter pilot is, right? Who is the person who is willing to strap themselves into this rocket with wings, essentially, with missiles and a machine gun attached to it and fly toward the enemy. Like, who is that person? And how does that person then and that collection of people who are like that person who come together to create the fighter squadron that we have seen in the movies that we've read about in the books or that you are going to explain that is true within the Air Force now? Yeah. So I think stereotypically, uh, you know, it's going to be somebody who is maybe inclined to a little bit more of that risk, that high tempo, exciting passions and things like that. Again, we're stereotyping here of like an interest in motorcycles or fast cars or, or things like that, that'll get the blood boiling. Adrenaline junkies. Adrenaline junkie. Exactly. You know, going down the mountain as fast as you can, you're not turning or anything. You're going your 40, 50 miles an hour down a ski slope, as well as kind of a performance and interest in excelling, I think I would say as well, of not just performing well, obviously a high regard to that, but pushing themselves and wanting to do more of that and continuing to reach that next level and next higher standard. You put kind of those things together, and I think that's what you would get is stereotypical of, you know, what you see in the movies for a fighter pilot. And then, you know, maybe what we think about as far as fighter squadrons and who would maybe go to that, you know, again, stereotypically. And, you know, not stereotypically, just looking at today and contemporarily, I think a lot of that holds true. I would say, you know, just in my time, you know, geez, about 12, 13 years of flying fighters now, as well as just growing up around the community a little bit as well of it has changed. It has changed a little bit, but I don't think for the worse at all, just in the almost, I'd say, kind of 
acceptance of many different paths to get here as opposed to what maybe 20 years ago was like, hey, this is kind of what's expected and what you should do. And now, you know, we've got a little bit more breadth to it, which I think is generally a good thing. I think it's been awesome. Yeah. So it has changed, but in okay. good ways. So you bring all those people who are risk and performance driven together. They have to find a way to operate together as opposed to individuals. And that community gets formalized into what is called the fighter squadron. What we want to do here today is talk not just about like what goes on in the squadron from an operational point of view, like the flying duties, non-flying duties. But what are some of like the cultural elements that go into the squadron? You know, the ceremonies, how do people earn a call sign? What is it like to attend a dining in or a dining out? Start to peel back some of the layers of that onion, pull back the curtain and help people understand what is the fighter squadron, both from a operational, but also a cultural point of view. Mm -hmm. Before getting into some of the duties, non-flying duties, ceremonies and things like that. So we talked a little bit about what kind of person would want to fly fighters, being a fighter squadron. And and so that's maybe just a part of it. Another part that I think is really important is the process along the way. And I think you've done some podcasts on, you know, how to go fly, how to be, you know, fly fighters and things like that. But to shorten it down pretty quickly is you perform real well in high school, you perform real well in college, you get selected for this. And then when you show up to pilot training, you're under the gun for six months or so learning to fly T-37s in my case, you know, back when, or T-6s now where you're getting evaluated, graded every single sortie in so many categories. That's a lot of pressure yeah. over time. And that's six months. And then you fly T-38s, do it again for six months. Then you do introduction to fighter fundamentals. You do it for three months. Then you do the basic course. You do it for nine months to a year. And then you end up at your fighter squadron. So you've been through about two years of a pressure cooker in so many ways. Yeah. You show up to your fighter squadron. Now you're a rookie. You're like that freshman on the the football team or soccer team. You're brand new and in a lot of ways kind of treated like that. You're a wingman. Wingman has a lot of meaning. There's a lot of semantics that go along with it. But it's true. You're the brand new rookie who doesn't necessarily know that much, despite the two years of the pressure cooker you've been through. Yeah. And so you take that, you know, performance focused individual, adrenaline junkie, two years of a pressure cooker, you just show up and you're like, Ooh, you're brand new. Yeah. That's the environment that you enter into as a brand new fighter pilot and that you build on over your years into a fighter squadron. I think that is a fundamental part of why a squadron is the way it is. As far as that fundamental part, again, we talked about World War One, World War Two, and the high risk endeavors and aerial combat is a high risk endeavor to begin with even in training. right, And so there's just that atmosphere of significance, I think, that goes along with it. And that, I think, underpins everything, flying, non-flying ceremonies as well. So as far as getting into the flying and you talk about what really any air crew, but especially the junior air crew are going to do is it's a whole lot focused on getting to be good and an expert in the trade in the basics and the fundamentals. We like to say, and it's a little bit of a trope, but the blocking and tackling, the basics of what you do, because you're a wingman, you can't lead anybody out there. You can't lead a two ship, a four ship. Uh, You aren't trusted with a lot of responsibility, even though flying fighter and your own fighter is quite a bit of responsibility when it comes down to it. Yeah. But in position and correcting and just be there, shoot on timeline and get the job done for a wingman, let the flight leads make those decisions and look out the rest of the formation. And so that study, that training is so fundamental to what we do. And then the upgrades as well. So you do the wingmanship for about a year, and then you'll go through your upgrades to lead two ship or a four ship or as required along the way. And that's going to take you probably, you know, two years to do completely your whole first assignment. So those are kind of the nuts and bolts of what you're doing and how you're driving it forward for yourself, let alone kind of for the squadron. So So you go through the pilot training pipeline. Mm -hmm. That's two years. You show up to the squadron and you have more training. You're a rookie, you're a wingman. How long does it take before like you are accepted into the fold where you're no longer considered an outsider? You're no longer a rookie. You're one of the guys. You're one of the gals. You're part of the squadron. Yep. How long does it take to get there? So I would say in a few different ways, you know, kind of being present in the squadron for about three to six months is a pretty good spot of like, okay, you're known in the squadron. I would say the first hurdle to overcome really beyond that is getting named. And we can talk more about that in a little bit. Okay. But that is, I would say, one of the, if not the biggest ways to say like, you are here, you're part of the squadron now. And that timing, that three to six months, I said, and the naming tend to coincide pretty decently. So, yep, your name, that implies you've been there a little while. And that is a kind of clear delineation between new guys and gals and everybody who's been around the block a time or two. I would say that the other one that is a pretty good grading criteria is also combat. 
So okay. first combat deployment, not that everybody gets a combat deployment, but most people in their first assignment do. I'd say there's a marked difference between those who have, you know, brand new, just went on a deployment, come back versus somebody who hasn't. And there's a lot of teeth cutting that goes along with that as well. You know, and, and keep in mind that that was, you know, in the global war on terror age that at least that was your experience. Now that GWAT has turned off and we're pivoting towards near peer competition, those combat deployments aren't going to happen nearly as often. Mm hmm. Arguably, hopefully, especially if we're talking about major combat operations. Well, yeah, exactly. That's what we hope for. <laughs> yeah. OK, well, you brought it up. So let's talk naming. Yeah. Let's talk call signs. Yeah, for sure. So it's awesome. It's such a cool tradition and a heritage that ties back many, many decades. I think at least World War. Well, I mean, I think they probably is World War II, certainly Vietnam as well. So it's, it's a longstanding tradition. Uh, we think naming and naming ceremony and poof, you end up with a name or a call sign. There's a lot more that leads up to it with the caveat of every squadron is going to do it a little bit differently. Every squadron uh -huh. has its own identity, own culture, every platform. So every airframe has its own identity and culture. So there will be different shades of gray and different styles, but by and large, they're pretty consistent. And so one reason why it takes three to six months or so before you get named is traditionally, we don't want to name somebody right when they show up because you want some dirt on them. Uh, so <laughs> if they haven't made any mistakes, then what's the fun of that? And it kind of limits on the stories. And so, yeah, some people, I mean, they've gone six months without a name. Some people have gone a year without a name because of TDYs and deployments and things like that. All it does is give more dirt. So it lends itself to some really good stories. <laughs> well, it, so it's not that they just fly perfectly for the whole year and that there's nothing on them. Yeah, exactly. And and what I would say is nobody's floated perfect story. I haven't, certainly never will, uh, which implies, you know, <laughs> there's you're always going to find something on somebody. Some more than others, some it kind of writes itself as far as the call sign goes and others, you have to be more creative. <laughs> but say you take the three to six months, you get some of those stories and then it leads up into the naming ceremony itself. And what I've seen used to some good effect is, you know, the more senior air crew led by the mayor. The mayor is kind of like the social coordinator. Very important role when it comes down to it. The mayor. Yeah. That's not a term that you hear very often in the Air Force. OK, so what's a mayor for the fighter squadron? So kind of like I said, mayor is a social coordinator in sense. Okay. So we have snacko, snack officers. Those are your brand new wingmen, lieutenant types who, you know, help make sure the bar is stocked and make sure the fridge has drinks and popcorns made, all those standard things. Are you talking specifically in the heritage room? Is that um... in, in the heritage room? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, and every squad and different again. And then the mayor is the one who would usually be like later first assignment or second assignment. They are not a wingman usually or unnamed folks. And they're going to be the one who helps just to coordinate things. Okay. They'll help to corral the snackos. They'll help to at least coordinate some events if the flight commanders don't necessarily themselves. And when it comes down to roll calls and namings, and we can talk more about roll calls in a little bit, the mayor is the pivotal character out there helping to run the show, if you will. And the and these two different positions, the, the snackos, the mayor, imagine that there's some other additional duties? Is that what these are? Or are these unofficial jobs that, uh, that people get in the squadron? Or are these like official responsibilities that end up on somebody's OPR? Uh, for the snack, though, uh, it's kind of been just a morale officer. Uh, okay. I mean, th there's not a whole lot of responsibility for a brand new first lieutenant in a fighter squadron, other than study, learn, get good at flying, and take care of kind of those basics yeah. that show good fighter pilot discipline and etiquette, if you will. So that could end up on an OPR. May or not necessarily. It's more of just, you know, an additional duty. It takes a certain personality as well to be able to corral 40, 50, 60 folks, depending on the size of the squadron, <laughs> help control the conversation, but not over control the conversation, yeah. help to manage the social environment. So there are good mayors and there are not so good mayors. Um, okay. <laughs> good, good mayors are just so fundamental to what the squadron is. And, and I've seen, seen some really good ones. So anyway, the mayor will be the one who runs the naming ceremony. Um, if they do it, okay. like I said, to some good effect, they'll do a pre-naming, which is like, hey, we've got all these stories on the three or four or five or however many guys and gals. You don't necessarily want too many. And then you'll just go down the list of the names. What names are out there? Anybody who has a story tells a story. And then you just kind of whittle it down to the one or two or however many that these are likely names. Litmus tests, there's nothing official. It's more just does this fit the person? Is it a good story? Can you tell a good story? But one that I think is a pretty good unofficial litmus test is the red flag test, which is basically okay. whatever call sign you give somebody should be one that if they were standing up in front of red flag, wouldn't be offensive, insulting to them, overly embarrassing, anything like that. Like 
you still got to, you know, treat them with respect uh, and really think yeah. that through down the road, you know, you don't want to just overshoot the coverage too early on something like that, which is inappropriate. So that's what the pre-naming is for to help get a lot of that, that work out of the way before the actual naming ceremony itself. Okay. So pre-naming has happened. Mm -hmm. The mayor hits their gavel on the bar. I don't know. I've never been to one of these. I don't, I don't know how exactly how this happens. And like you said, every squadron is going to be a little bit different, but give us an idea of maybe from your squadron or just a typical naming ceremony. Like how does it get called to order? Who's there? What are the proceedings? How does someone get their name or not get their name? Just walk us through the process. Yeah. So a lot of namings are going to start with a roll call. A roll call, a brief segue into that one is, it used to happen every Friday, every other Friday. It just depends on the mayor and the squadron and how often they want to do it as far as an event goes. And it'll usually last an hour or two. And it'll be everybody in there. It'll be no kidding, take roll. So starting with the wing commander on down, call everybody's call sign. Maybe somebody checked in. They're supposed to throw you know a dollar on in just because. Like, hey, I acknowledge that. I'm going to be flying or I have a simulator or I have other obligations. I, I just can't make it. Check in. Got it. They don't check in. You're supposed to find them, whatever you find them, <laughs> you know, just kind of that little bit of social punishment, go down and the list, call everybody's name. And then every squadron is going to do things a little bit different as far as like any newcomers to the bar or the heritage room, like, Hey, come and introduce yourself. Don't stand up and tell us any stories about yourself. Just come on in, give a bottle to the bar or whatever the gift of choice is for the bar. There are sometimes or a lot of times my bats, which is where folks will stand up and say what they screwed up okay. or call somebody else out for what they screwed up. So in the Bold Tigers, the 391st Fighter Squadron, when I was in there, you know, they did the Bold Tiger and the Cold Tiger. Bold Tiger is something awesome. Cold Tiger is somebody who clearly did not. Yeah. There's instant justices, which is just like, hey, maybe I'm not going to tell a particular story, like really long story, but just a quick, hey, point the finger at somebody to say you screwed this up and get a couple laughs out of that as well. Any longer story is supposed to be preceded by a toast. So some creativity going along with that. And so that's kind of the roll call setting. And I think the roll calls are really important because there's airing of grievances, there's camaraderie, there's, I think, a unimportant openness and honesty that goes along with it, transparency. It's kind yeah. of like a social debriefing. It's always hard to be the one called out for something done wrong or in you know, the bold tiger case, the cold tiger, you know, doing something wrong, but it helps keep things real and honest, which is important. So. Uh, that's kind of the roll call in a nutshell. Yeah. And that seems really interesting because you know, pilots are already known for having a lot of time spent in briefings, the pre-brief to the flight, the debrief afterward, but that's specific to the mission. You're saying from what you're describing, at least as how I understand it, this is a continued debrief, but not necessarily related directly to a sortie that happened that day. There may be some other things, like you said, that it's social in nature, that these airing of grievances, these stories that are being told, these toasts that are being given that are not necessarily specific to flying an aircraft. Is that correct? Absolutely correct. Some of the best learning that goes on is in the informal settings at you know, a bar, a restaurant on TDY, or at something like a roll call. And I would say back to the roll call example and with the debriefing and those airing of grievances is generally, arguably, the healthier squadrons are going to be the ones where people are comfortable enough to come up and say that and, you know, self-critique or get critiqued by their peers, but move on, internalize mm -hmm. it, move on from those lessons versus the ones where, you know, everybody's a little bit more close hold with that sort of stuff. Nobody really wants to self-identify and that kind of lends itself to potentially a more counterculture as far as what you really want in the flying world. And again, you know, rank comes off in a debrief for a reason and it's really important to get better, to be safe, to make each other better. And it's in the same in a social setting too. It's just interesting to think about like the trope of, you know, critique in private, praise in public, where it seems like you're just doing both in public. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very true. That's very true. It probably comes around a little bit from just the heritage and tradition of, you know, fighting in combat, you know, like you're under that risk and under that pressure at all times. You make a mistake. You could have cost somebody else their life or putting their life in danger. Like, yeah, uh, that isn't something that you necessarily always or naturally, you know, critique in private. Like that's something that's there of, you know, this is a big deal. And oh, by the way, everybody else can learn from this, too. So, yeah, yeah, it kind of an interesting contrast for sure on that one. But the roll call tends to be the lead into the naming ceremony. So you kind of already get the creative juices flow and you get the energy there, the social yep. dynamic in place with that first hour or two with the roll call. And then you kick the young uns out, the guys and gals who are getting named, and usually you try to keep it to just a couple or a few because yeah. uh, otherwise it gets unwieldy and just takes a long amount of time. And they go off to the side. They're kind of just 
hanging out, socializing with some of the other younger folks or however it's designed just to kind of give some order to the process. And then usually, you know, discussions will continue to happen. So we did the pre-naming. So now you'll have more discussions with the naming because maybe you didn't have everybody there before. you got those creative juices flowing. After the roll call, you get more discussion and talking. And then you'll bring each of the new folks in, the namies in one by one. They'll usually come on in. They may give a gift to the bar or the heritage room, you know, favorite bottle of alcohol or something that's, you know, particular heritage memento or something, whatever they kind of get guided on. Okay. And then usually they get kicked out. They don't usually get named right away. Yeah. You know, just keep the entertainment going and keep it going. And so you go through iterations of that with each person where they'll come in, here you go, make a toast yeah, and then get kicked out. And then sometimes there are little creative feats of strength that people do, <laughs> which is, which is always pretty entertaining. And, uh, is something that the mayor tends to come up with. So, I mean, it could be as simple as arm wrestling. Honestly, it could be as simple as I've seen people like with grocery carts or something like that, pretending to fly airborne, throwing little softballs <laughs> at each other. Uh, you know, something just to be creative yeah. and get some laughs and then usually kick the young ones back out again. And then finally, after going through a couple iterations of that, there will obviously be the discussions about names. Some names are super easy. And so it's settled on and already known. And so you give some kind of fake names. Yeah. Other names, it could be contentious all the way up to the very end. And no kidding, it's like this final debate between two articulate folks who are like, it should be this or it should be that. And then one of them wins usually just by volume, like loudness <laughs> of the crowd. And then that's it. And so then you bring the wingmen, the namies in one by one, and you give them their name and then kind of wrap up that portion of the ceremony as it stands, however the squadron does it. And usually what I've seen is the namey who just got named gets to stick around and be a part now of the group and the family while they bring their peers in and, you know, wrap everything up for the evening. Okay. And then you just hang out for a while. Okay. So you mentioned these articulate individuals who are having this, I guess, elevated discussion. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> About what the, the name should or should not be. Who are these people? Is it open to anyone to present a name and argue for why it should be given to that individual? Or is it limited to certain individuals in the squadron? Who are those participants? Anybody, really. Yep. Rain comes off the debrief and same pretty much in the roll call. And some names might have been identified in that pre-naming and some may come out during the actual naming discussions that somebody hadn't been there to present earlier. Somebody thought of as time went on, somebody decided like, Hey, the names we had aren't good enough. So I'm going to come up with something else. Okay. Come up with a new acronym or otherwise. And it could run the gamut of, you know, a named first Lieutenant. So they're already named. They're already part of the crew. If you will, that the upperclassmen, if you will, maybe has a really good idea and they throw that out there and they're able to uh, advocate for it all the way up to maybe the squadron commander or the DO or something like that. And it goes toe to toe really kind of, with the crowd of what, what names preferred at that point. But yeah, anybody can throw down with it and offer that up. Okay. And the person who is receiving the name, do they get any say in the matter? Ideally not. Usually if you try to pick your name or shape your name, it doesn't end well for you. <laughs> so the best thing to do is just accept what you're given or you'll probably be given a worse one. <laughs> it's a pretty good guiding rule. So no, not normally. Although I guess you could say they do have a hand in it because whatever you know, error they made or something stupid that they did is, okay. is, is their contribute a contribution to the cause. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. That makes sense. All right. And then they're given their name, like what makes it official? Is it that they can now put it on their name plate that goes on their uniform or is it written down in a air force record somewhere? Is there an air force form that catalogs all call signs? Like how does this name now carry on with that person from that point on? Really with just, I would say, a social cementing of the name and that person. I mean, it's a very, very stark transition from, you know, using the different squadrons here. We've got the T-Volts, the Tigers, and the Buccaneers. You know, T-Volts, yeah. when you're not named, you're a Sparky. Well, when you're just <laughs> random Sparky. When you're a Tiger and you're not named, you're a Cub. And when you're a Buccaneer and you're not named, you're a Swabby. So, like, you're just one each of those. Um, and so it's a very big, you know, clear transition that now you're part of the named crowd. And... It takes some getting used to for the individual, but the rest of the squadron tends to be pretty quick to say, hey, you're no longer, you know, swabby or sparky anymore. You're whatever your call sign is. And then name tags are ordered immediately. That's what you throw down on lineup cards for flying. Different squadrons may actually put it down on like some, you know, informal tracker or something like that. Like the Tigers actually give out Tiger numbers. Okay. Starting with Tiger number one all the way to, I think it's up to Tiger number 700s now. Uh, and so, you know, that is one way to do it. But when I was in the T-Bolts, I don't think we necessarily did that. So there are different ways, shapes and forms, but after you get it, 
it's just collectively used. And then, I mean, that cements itself over time. Okay. I mean, just hearing those three different squadrons, if I was there, and especially with the Buccaneers, I would want that naming ceremony to happen as soon as possible, because I do not want to be called Swabby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're not supposed to be complimentary names while you, while you have them, because you're a rookie. And then I would say the only other thing is, so once you get a call sign, it, it doesn't normally change. We call it replotting. Sometimes you get replotted, but very, very rare. But the general tradition, again, we're talking traditions here, nothing, nothing official is once you go to combat with your call sign, that's your call sign. That's your name. It's not supposed to be taken away from you now or replotted. So okay. again, going back to cutting your teeth in war, there you go. Then, you know, that gives you the benefit of you own that from there on out. It's amazing to see you know, now that I've had a call sign for plenty of time, as time goes on, it really starts to become just the name that you use. I, I mean, there are people that I know, I don't know necessarily their last name. I certainly don't know their first name, but I know their call sign and that's it. <laughs> right. In fact, when we were deployed, we were joking and talking about trying to do first name Fridays because just for something different when we were deployed. Yeah. And then we gave up on that immediately because nobody knew anybody's first name. So <laughs> it's just about the call signs. <laughs> well, that's excellent. Well, great. I would love to be a fly on the wall to see one of these naming ceremonies take place. Do you allow outsiders to, to come and witness this or is it pretty well locked down that only members of the squadron can be there? Uh, it's pretty selective. It's not just members of the squadron. Sometimes you'll have guests who come on in, usually other flyers and aviators. But every once in a while, it'll be, you know, intel officers will come on in, other officers will come on in. I think our chaplain in one of my squadrons would come on in. And it really just kind of depended, but it wasn't necessarily open the gates, invite everybody in. Really a pretty select crowd when it came down to it. Well, and I've seen some of those officers who are not fighter pilots have call signs. So they potentially went through a similar thing with a fighter squadron or another squadron for their career field did something similar as well. That's a possibility. Yes, absolutely. You know, some non-flying squadrons do that, but yeah, plenty of non-flyers will come in and especially if they've been working hard and been a valued part of the squadron, of which there are plenty, they'll get invited on in and named and kind of to the point of letting outsiders in or not. And, and I said, you know, a pretty select few or select crowd that are let in who aren't part of the squadron kind of goes back to that original piece of you're airing grievances yeah and you're not just praising in public you're critiquing and criticizing in public like that takes a lot of effort to do and so you know it's a very important environment that you have and so if you invite too many people in or people that aren't part of that fold there's a risk of now people aren't comfortable uh, necessarily in the same way so it's fun right. and striking the right balance with it yeah, definitely want to have the right mix of individuals to create that environment and make sure that any information that is shared there stays within the fighter squadron family, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've gone over the naming ceremony, but there are some other ceremonies that happen within the fighter squadron, such as uh, the dinings in and out. Give us an idea you know, for anyone in the audience who has no clue what we're talking about when we say dining in, dining out, what are these things and how often do they happen within the fighter squadron? How do they happen? Why do they happen? Let's give some information on that as well. Yeah. So start off first with a how often, at least my time at Mountain Home, we haven't done one for a while, just based on TDYs, deployment schedules, COVID, yeah. all that sort of stuff is throwing a wrench in it. And so it varies. I would say roll calls and namings are much more frequent. Roll calls because it's that informal debriefing, important to keep the pulse of the squadron. Namings because you get new people in all the time. You got to name them. Yeah. Dining ins, dining outs are not as structured in the same way as timeline goes. So they happen, I think, a little bit more infrequently. But usually uh, what you do is you just gather the whole squadron together in whatever setting. It could be a hangar. It could be a place off base. It really just depends. You pull everybody on in. Uh, you may have a lot of times a grog bowl, which is usually some terrible concoction as far as that all goes. And then it's a lot like kind of a roll call in a slightly more formal setting of there's a meal involved. Okay. There's potentially some storings or call outs of folks where you know, in that case, you have to go drink from the grog bowl and it's disgusting. And then you kind of cycle on through. So all a lot of the same as far as camaraderie goes, some amp it up a little bit more with Nerf guns or water balloons or things like that and termed a little bit more of a combat dining in or dining out. Yeah. Um, but those really, really just depend on whoever's designing it, what they're trying to get out of it. And it's not just a squadron thing. Sometimes it's a squadron level. I know, I think in the last couple of years at Mountain Home, we were trying to do a wing wide or at least an ops group wide dining in 
And then it was just affected because of COVID. But yeah, yeah. different levels can do it. And obviously, the more people, the more uh, pandemonium ensues and uh, <laughs> uh, it, it pretty entertaining. So, yep. But that's a pretty common one as well. The bigger your grog bowl will need to be. Yep. Yep. Uh, one of the other ones, since we're just talking, you know, traditions, ceremonies, if you will, is piano burning. Okay. So piano burning is not as often talked about, I would say, as, you know, roll call or naming or combat dunning in or something but in some ways is more sacred, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and so the story goes is back in World War II, there was a particular fighter squadron out in England, you know, Battle of Britain time and stuff like that. And there was a pilot who would play the piano and just regale all his comrades and peers with the piano. And everybody loved it, a little bit of levity at the end of long days. And one day he didn't come home. And so there's a piano sitting in the corner. Everybody's, you know, it's already tough enough. And now just the silence is overbearing. And so the commander, so it goes that, take the piano out and burn it. And so there you go, put the piano out, they burned it as a way to kind of commemorate and help get a little bit of closure and move on. And so, like I said, it's a pretty sacred tradition. If there's a, a loss of life in the fighter community, a lot of times the squadron will go out and burn a piano. Before I deployed my last deployment, you know, that was part of our roll call kind of out together. We're leaving in a couple of weeks, give or take. We had a piano out there. So we all just kind of gather together, kind of symbolic in that. And then at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, it's pretty cool because it's the uh, home of the Eagle Squadron. So the first U.S. squadrons that flew, basically a group of volunteers that went out to World War II before the U.S. formally entered yeah. into World War II. And so they were the Eagle Squadrons. And so at Seymour Johnson, they will do a Battle of Britain party and each of the squadrons will have their own pianos and just a lot of cool tradition that goes along with that too. And heritage all the way back to World War II. So you say that the piano burning is to commemorate the loss of life, but it, you're also uh, saying that it can be uh, to commemorate other things, but in a more sacred nature, as opposed to like the riotous combat dining in or the roll calls. It's not a place to air those grievances, but to experience some community catharsis. Yeah, I would say so. And it's not always going to be independent of a roll call or those sorts of things. But there is, yeah, a certain measure of catharsis. There's a commemoration, a closure, a celebration as well. And that could be about a person. It could be about kind of a phase of, you know, life, like getting ready for going on a deployment and all the emotions that are building up inside people before they do that, getting ready to say goodbye to their families for six months. Or like the Battle of Britain party, which is now a celebration of the heritage and traditions and a tie back to, you know, 75-ish years ago. That's fascinating. I had heard about the original piano burning. I didn't realize that it was a more ubiquitous thing that happened throughout the fighter culture, because unlike the naming, unlike dining and dining out, I don't think that the piano burning has really infiltrated or diffused to the rest of the Air Force. I would say, yeah, I haven't seen that either. It's still pretty located just within the, the fighter squadron, fighter squadron culture. And again, I'm speaking just from my experience in the striking community. I'm not as familiar with the, the F-16s, F-22s, if they do the same, but at least in the strike eagle community, we do. And again, it's rare, but I think it's still a, a pretty significant ceremony and tradition that is pretty neat how it's continued on. Yeah. Well, and on that note, let's talk about how the fighter culture has diffused to the rest of the Air Force. And the reason I want to have this conversation is you're probably familiar with Peter Drucker's statement that culture eats strategy for lunch, right? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. uh, we can have all kinds of policy. The bureaucracy can be what it is. We can develop all kinds of strategy for the employment of air power. But what's really going to drive the way that the Air Force operates? It's culture, right? Mm -hmm. And if we can get the culture piece right that makes it that much easier for us to get the rest of the strategy and the tactical employment of aircraft right. Mm -hmm. So I want to start there and also have, and also bring in the fact that the air force is most frequently going to be led at the highest levels by a pilot of some sort and not always, but frequently that's going to be a fighter pilot who comes up through the air force, gets called a swabby, eventually gets a name, goes on combat deployment, becomes a commander, maybe is a mayor, does all of these things and carries that culture with them to higher and higher levels of the Air Force. And that then influences those other organizations at the higher and higher levels. And so much of what the Air Force, as I understand it and as I see it, is some sort of reflection of, at large, the smaller fighter squadron. 
And so what is your take on that? You are a fighter pilot. You haven't yet made it uh, up to general officer, but can you see why I'm saying that the Air Force is a reflection of the fighter squadron? Yeah, I can. And it's funny you mentioned that quote because that was one I'd been thinking about too as soon as we started talking about culture and I think uh, about a fighter squadron and fighter squadron culture. And I think it's very apropos to that as well. You take a strike equal squadron that is flying the same airplanes, doesn't have the strongest culture versus one that's flying the same airplanes and does have a strong culture. And I think we all know which one is probably going to be performing better, especially over the long run, whether in garrison or in combat. So I think the culture is a, is a hugely important piece. And I think culture is so much shaped by, not exclusively, but so much shaped by the leadership, whether you're talking about the formal leadership of the commander as well as informal leadership of a mayor and the flight commanders right. and just the social dynamics there as well. And that's squadron all the way on up. So I think it's absolutely an important question. What I would say is I don't think, and we'll caveat this with, I don't think Fighter squadrons, fighter pilots, fighter air crew necessarily have a monopoly on, you know, any of the attributes that are being brought to the fight by, you know, the general fighter pilot or fighter squadron. Maybe it's a little bit of, you know, the stereotypes, but I've seen fantastic people in any career field, every career field who have come in with the same sort of attitudes. And I think it's attitudes and approaches that lead to success and not specifically a career field. Okay. But I think there are some things that are maybe more inherent or developed, like culturally developed in a fighter squadron. Uh, and we tease them out a little bit more and, and develop them um, arguably a little bit more intentionally, I guess you could say. Yeah. One of those is going to be problem solving, I think is really important. I like to say, you know, I don't have all the answers. I don't even know all the problems, but you put a couple of fighter pilots, fighter air crew in a room and say, hey, here's the challenge, whether you're talking about let's solve this mission, let's come up with this new tactic let's figure out what to do with today's newest adversary or something like that. And it really quickly goes into, let's look at the problem. Let's try and solve this problem. Let's get into it, distill it down to whatever form is appropriate and and come up with solutions. So I think problem solving is something that fighter squadrons cultivate and have brought to the fight. And then along with that, hand in hand is creative thinking. Not completely, but I think a lot of fighter squadrons tend to bring out some pretty unique and innovative thinking whether that's in tactical sense or a policy sense or a social cultural sense and activities and ways to bring a squadron together. Like it's pretty awesome. And not everybody's going to be the same aptitude with it. But if you say, Hey, I'm not going to tell you how to do things. I'm going to tell you what to do. You know, surprise me with your ingenuity sort of thing as the quote goes. Yeah. Fighter squadron is going to take it and run with it. And so I think both of those are really important. The other thing that I would say is an attitude of get to yes. If it's not illegal, immoral, and ethical, Hey, let's get to yes. A no, especially a quick no, is probably not the only answer and probably not even the right answer. Yeah. And so how do we get to yes on it? And a lot of what we've talked about, I think, so far has been kind of a fighter squadron in garrison. What are we doing back home station and stuff like that? But it applies downrange as well. And because the fighter squadron is developed to prepare to go downrange and deploy, there's that immediate and close connection to that experience. And so that get to yes of like, hey, we have to get this mission done in combat. And, you know, we've got our vulnerability period. It's 30 minutes airborne or whatever it is, or we have this delivered strike we have to do. You don't just get to say, well, this is hard. Like, okay, we have to figure out how to get to yes to make this happen or have those conversations back and forth to figure out why it can't and what we need to do differently. So on with that creative thinking and the problem solving. And so that's like, you know, a little vignette in a combat environment. It applies even in training and in garrison for a fighter squadron. And then the last thing that I'll offer on up as well is back to the debriefs, like we talked about. The roll up the sleeves, debrief doesn't have a rank. Let's talk about it. Let's fess up if you did something. Let's take the beatings, you know, as far as the verbal critique and analysis and criticism of what you may have done wrong, get better for it and, you know, not make excuses for errors that you made along the way. And so those are kind of four or five quick things that I would say fighter squadrons, by virtue of a fighter squadron culture at a very lower tactical level, have by virtue of, you know, different leadership along the way and brought as personalities as they've gone up in rank and, and experience and leadership, been able to bring to some pieces and parts all along up to, you know, ideally even to the headquarters Air Force level as well. Yeah. As I'm listening to you describe the fighter pilot's mentality and approach toward problem solving, I keep thinking about how your development in the fighter squadron helps prepare you for problem solving in that 
it's that much easier for you to focus on the problem instead of other people. Because of that process of debriefing and the airing of grievances, you've already developed this thick skin and this ability to not let things phase you quite as much and keep focused on the things that truly matter, Mm -hmm. which is the accomplishment of the mission, the task at hand, and keeping the people to your right and to your left alive, Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And if you can strengthen the, the relationship, the bond with those people along the way, great. And we all know that misery loves company. We all know that suffering together forges those bonds. And so I can see how, because of the way that the fighter culture is set up, that it helps to get you to a point where you can solve these problems more directly, more effectively. Yep, absolutely. And like I said, I caveated it at the beginning and I'll still say it now of there's no monopoly on any of that, but you kind of read it through the culture that you have in a fighter squadron going back to that second lieutenant, first lieutenant who shows up as an unnamed rookie in the squadron. They learn it along the way. They've hopefully learned it a little before their first operational squadron, but it's drilled into them even more so once they actually get there. What I would say is ironically, you know, because you're talking about like the upper echelons and, and, you know, how fighter squadron culture kind of proliferates through and has underpinned a fair amount of the Air Force. You know, something that is arguably a weakness, I guess, of it all is because we learn about that in such an environment and you grow up learning with other people in the same form, in the same fashion from operational assignment to operational assignment, operational assignment. Yeah. I I think there's a little bit of comfort of knowing that you can debrief like that. You can roll up your sleeves. You do have that kind of culture and transparency and criticism. And then when you start moving beyond a fighter squadron or an operation group or potentially even a fighter wing, really interacting with different agencies, or you think about at the Pentagon and, and staffs and things, and there has to be, I think, that ability to step back and say, okay, all that stuff is really good and important. Now, how can you shape it a little bit differently? relevant to your audience uh, so that your audience can get the goodness of it. Because otherwise, I mean, and I've seen it happen in a wing meeting back when I was at Seymour Johnson years ago of fighter Wizzo was running whatever program and was pretty direct with a couple constructively critical comments Yeah, to which the wing commander dialed it back and was like, hold on just a second. Like the audience is different and, you know, you could burn some bridges here, burn some goodwill that maybe you didn't have to. In a fighter squadron, it would go fine. You're right. But elsewhere, kind of stepping back a little bit more and, and finding that fertile soil for the core of all those things. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, point to bring up that the fighter squadron is very homogeneous in its way of thinking and its approach, even if there's some diversity in the actual people themselves, that there's more women now than there ever have been people of color that there didn't used to be. So we're getting different perspectives in that regard, but the culture is so strong that it forces eventually all of those people to think like fighter pilots. And we're grateful for that, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. But as you said, and I appreciate you doing so, that that doesn't always fly uh, elsewhere in the Air Force. Mm-hmm. You see what I did there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well played. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'll be here all day. <laughs> I think that's a really valuable perspective to have is that as good and as great as the fighter squadron culture has been for the Air Force, it is not always what we need. And that is just true in general for leadership that not every problem is going to be a nail and you're going to have the perfect hammer to hammer it down. Mm -hmm. But you're going to be confronted with a variety of different problems and therefore you need to have a variety of tools available to you to approach those problems. And more than likely, those different tools that you're going to rely upon are not going to be skill sets that you have developed, but your connections to other people who don't look or think like you do. Mm hmm. Exactly. And that's what I say during my welcome brief in the squadron. Like I said earlier, is I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the problems, you know, and talking to all the different people around working with a whole team, whether that's inside a fighter squadron or well beyond a fighter squadron, you're looking at the the entire team, whatever part of the force. Yeah. You know, we got to work together on it and uh, all the goodness that a fighter squadron brings. I would want it to find a fertile soil in folks who, you know, are receptive to it, maybe not turned away from it because of, you know, a particular approach that maybe wasn't appropriate at that time. Right. And, you know, the other piece of this is that people who are outside of the fighter squadron, they look at the debrief and your approach to problem solving and they get offended by it. 
even if they're not directly in contact with it. And we often hear, or they come into the fighter squadron and they're just not prepared for it. And so we often hear about like the toxic nature of the fighter squadron and and the need to dial things down and, and tame the fighter pilots a little bit more and uh, make things a little bit more, help you all have a softer approach and more egalitarian and not be so uh, totalitarian. And maybe there is some truth to that, but really what I want to ask is, like, what is the future for the fighter squadron and the culture? Where is it headed? Especially as we look to near peer competition, agile combat employment, dispersed operations. Where do you see the future of the fighter squadron and its culture going in order to ensure that the Air Force continues to be effective in employing air power? Yeah, I think really interesting and, and broad question there as far as, you know, some things that I think we already relate to already. I mean, when we fly and we train, it's not just strictly global war on terror. I mean, we're training all the way in up to high end fights already anyway. Right. And so we're kind of doing it and already thinking forward to that uh, paradigm, if you will. But all those things I talked about, the problem solving, creative thinking, the getting to yes and, and solving things, the debriefing, those sorts of things that I put out as just a couple core things that I think fighter squadrons have given to the Air Force, I think are going to apply. I think it's going to continue to apply whether we're talking about, you know, agile combat employment, whether we're talking about potential major combat operations, whether we're talking about going back to the Middle East and some, you know, less major combat operations, different things like that. All those still, I think, apply. I think they're at the root of, of kind of how we are at a fighter squadron. Some of the cultural traditions and things like that, you know, we say flexibility is a key to air power. Flexibility is a key to culture in a lot of ways as well. Right. And sometimes people will anchor on a particular thing or you know, a particular tradition. And I think that's where my perspective is a little different, having grown up around flying squadrons in the sense of I've seen it for 30-ish years, plus years. And, you know, plenty of things have changed, but the more things have changed, the more they stay the same. And those things that have stayed the same are the core things that we yeah. want to stay the same, that we want to continue into the future that'll help us solve some of these big challenges we have ahead for us. One of the funny examples of things changing was one of the guys in the Bucks was was passing a little social advice to one of the younger air crew in the squadron. He was like, hey, you don't wear a bag over two shoulders. You wear a bag over one shoulder. It was a backpack. It's like, okay, interesting. Because what I had learned growing up was you don't wear a bag on your shoulder at all. You carry it in your hand. Yeah. yeah. Things, things change. Not a big deal, you know? Right. And so, you know, hinging an identity on something like that, eh, flexibility. We'll move on. We'll adapt. We'll change. Uh, change to what the Air Force needs and what society needs. And but really those cores, I think, are going to remain the same. I think they will because, again, a lot of what we do as a basis in a fighter squadron isn't geared to just being a fighter squadron. Is it geared to just going into the airspace and garrison and over the United States? It's what that look towards over the horizon and what we, we would do in war. Awesome. So to wrap up here, let's see if we can get a good story out of you. We have not been drinking, but let, let's see if we can find something that gets a rise out of the audience that quintessential this is what goes on in the fighter squadron. It could be a spirit mission. It could be a naming ceremony gone awry. It could be a piano burning that was just so poignant. I can see the dream and the stars in your eyes right now as you're contemplating your answer. I, I just want to uh, see if you can distill down for the audience in a good story. There you were shooting your watch with your buddies that helps bring the rest of the audience into the fighter squadron. Yeah. So you saw me kind of thinking because I was like, oh boy, what am I going to end up with here? Um, I think I found, I think I found a good one. So a few years back when I was in the 389th fighter squadron of the T-Bolts, you know, the catchphrase is shock them, which is pretty awesome. Thunderbolts is, is, is the full name there. And so we were down in Nellis for gunfighter flag or sorry, green flag. So kind of a close air support type mission, working with the yep. army a little bit really early morning goes. And I think it was the one weekend in the middle we ended up doing, I, I think it was a roll call naming. So, you know, kind of like we talked about before the roll call into the naming, we're at some hotel down on the strip, you know, good way to let our hair down, let loose a little bit, especially with a, a busy week of flying. And so we go there and we get into all the roll call part. Uh, and one of the like traditions in the squad at the time was a conformity check. So conformity okay. check is to make sure everybody is the same, right? You're talking a uh, homogenous group of people, right? So it's like, hey, does everybody have their RMO? Does everybody have the same color pair of socks? Same Friday t-shirt, whatever it was, you know, like all those things. 
And then one of the young bucks, I don't think they had been named yet. They were getting named that night, if I remember correctly. They come on in like, all right, who doesn't have their T-Bolt tattoo? And no kidding, there were about mm, 10 folks that show up that had their T-Bolt tattoo because they happened to get it in Vegas that week or that weekend. (laughs) And they show off their T-Bolt tattoo and everybody just couldn't believe their eyes. And so everybody else, including myself, who didn't get a tattoo, had to go up and take a drink because that was the conformity <laughs> check that was posed by the audience and, uh, you know, and by one of the young guys or gals. So it was pretty funny. They still have it. People still get the tattoos and it still makes for a funny story. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask where the tattoo. I, it, do, do you have? And no, I don't want to ask. <laughs> yeah, that's why I didn't say anything. So, yeah. <laughs> Conform the location of the tattoo itself. OK, moving on. <laughs> I love hearing your passion, your love for the fighter squadron, for your pilot brothers and sisters and the positive effect that and influence that it has had on the rest of the Air Force. Yes, there have been some bad apples in the group. Yes, there have certainly been uh, things that have gone on in fighter squadrons that have not been good for the Air Force. But I think by and large across the Air Force and through time, fighter squadrons have been good for the Air Force. It's one of the primary reasons why we have been as successful as we have been for the time that the Air Force has been around. Yep, I, I would agree. And I would say kind of to wrap things up for my eyes, you know, as you said, the brotherhood, sisterhood, like it very much is a family endeavor. It very much is a family endeavor. There's that connective tissue between, you know, the present day fighter squadron with World War One, World War Two, Korean War, Vietnam, you know, Persian Gulf, etc. And so there's that connection. It's a family affair in the sense of like, we're all brothers and sisters when we're in there. Uh, we're looking out for each other. We're looking out, uh, you know, uh, to make each other better and, and sharpening each other. And that's a certain part of it as well. And then it's a family affair in the sense of like families are so invested in it too. You know, there's a huge demand on the families at home, the spouses, the kids and things. Yeah. But that's why fighter squadrons have such a strong spouse network. That's why we do so many first Fridays together and get everybody together in an informal, you know, family friendly environment as well. And so those bonds are strong, you know, bonds are strong between time, between each other and between families as well. So it's a pretty special thing to be a part of. Yeah. And that's something that we didn't even get into. I'm sure that would be a great, I guess, follow up to this podcast is the actual family dynamic, you know, those who have spouses and sweethearts and children, how they all get brought into the greater family of the fighter squadron. And so we'll put a pin in that and visit that topic another time. But if somebody just can't wait Mm -hmm. And they want to get in touch with you to uh, pick your brain on fighter squadron culture, being a strike eagle pilot. Maybe they are a newly elected mayor and they need some ideas for naming ceremonies. How would you recommend that people get in touch with you? Yeah. So I would love that. That'd be awesome. It'd be a ton of fun. I'll give my work email first. Great place to touch base with. Uh, Check it all the time, obviously, because I'm anchored to that thing. And then go from there and happy to chat with anybody via email, via phone, FaceTime, Zoom, whatever. So uh, I'll spell it out. It's Nicholas, N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dot Jurowitz, J-U-R-E-W-I-C-Z at U-S dot A-F dot mil. I'm lucky with a weird name like that. I don't have any numbers in my email. So just shoot me an email, get in touch with me. Would love to chat. Would love to answer any questions, give ideas or otherwise, or learn something in the process too. But a ton of fun to catch up with folks. Yeah, absolutely. We'll link those emails in the show notes. But I am slightly disappointed that you don't have the email spike at us.af.mil. I mean, shouldn't that be a thing? It should be. It should be. I see some people put in their official emails with their call sign in parentheses. So I haven't done it yet. I need to do it. That's on my list of to-dos. Uh, but yeah, it's out there because like I said, nobody knows first names or last names for that matter. So call signs are ready to go. Who is Nick Jurowitz? Nobody's ever heard of him. Yeah, but exactly. Know, Spike, we know Spike. <laughs> yep, yep. Awesome. One final question for you. Yeah. What does it mean to be an officer? Ooh. What does it mean to be an officer? Well, <sighs> good question. I wasn't expecting that one to wrap up with. <laughs> you know, I would put all that, a lot of weight on the shoulders of the word officer in a sense of it's inherent with leadership. You're the one setting the culture and the tone of whatever you're doing, whether you're leading at a, a smaller level or at a bigger level. You're setting the example along the way. You're representing the Air Force along the way. And so, you know, to me, officership is very synonymous with leadership. Maybe not exactly the same, but very synonymous with leadership. And there's a huge burden of responsibility that goes along with it that we're entrusted even as a second lieutenant and then certainly all the way on up. So that's kind of what I think about it in broad brush strokes. So hopefully answer enough to the question. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel Nicholas Jerwitz. Spike, it has been a pleasure. Anything else that you want to leave the audience with before we get out of here? No, sir. Colin, thanks for the chance to talk. It's been a pleasure. Really enjoyed being on the show. And thanks for having me on the podcast. Absolutely. All right, Reed. So we've now had the chance, the audience has had the chance to hear from Spike. Man, fighter culture. Fascinating, right? Yeah. Who knew that there was so much to it? Yeah. I, again, I did not expect the very interesting history lesson that he started with. Yeah. Right. This idea that early, early, early on, you have people figuring out how to use an airplane and this blurring of well, what's a civilian activity with an airplane, what's a military activity with an airplane. But it all centers in and around this idea of risk. And I know that's something you wanted to really kind of bring up to the fore. Well, yeah. I mean, think about it. You're a pilot back in you know, 1915, right? This is a brand new piece of equipment and you don't know everything that it's capable of or what the dangers are. I mean, clearly getting off the ground at any amount of height is an inherently risky thing to do. And then to bring up a firearm or to strap a machine gun to your airplane and time it so that it can shoot between the propeller... <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, you're just asking for trouble and it didn't take very long for the technology to improve and you know, the capability to escalate and also the risk to escalate with it. And as they're developing this technology and learning how to use it, seeing how to employ it, you know, what are the military applications and those kinds of things at the same time, trying to figure out how to manage the risk of it all. And I think I mean, I might be wrong, but I feel like the risk that underlies everything that they do is really what is driving so much of the culture and how they operate. I mean, look at it this way. If you draw a two by two matrix, you know, that we are such big fans of in the military, you put risk on one hand, and you put frequency on the other, that gives you four quadrants where there's high risk, low risk, low frequency, high frequency. And the combination of those things, right? Obviously, I'm not going to worry too much about low risk, low frequency kind of things, right? That kind of stuff, you're just willing to train down that risk. And then on the opposite end is the high risk, high frequency things where you know what you're doing is a very dangerous thing. That the risk that something could go wrong and that lives could be lost, equipment could be broken, those kinds of things, that is a real thing that you have to come to grips with but it's high frequency. You're going to see it on a regular basis. And so you can, again, train for it. You can manage that risk. You can lower it through training and familiarity and experience. But there are these things that are high risk, low frequency, that it just doesn't happen enough. You can't experience it enough to where you can train to it enough to lower that risk. And so it feels like what these pilots are having to do is to learn how to recognize risk, lower it if they can, transfer it if they can, or in many circumstances, especially when it's high risk, low frequency, buy it. They have to buy the risk. They have to own it. And so much of what they do, I feel like, is going to be in that regime. Yeah. And in order to get after it, what do they do? They spend a lot of time debriefing, a lot of time talking to each other, trying to solve these problems. And then that, that mentality, that approach of lowering risk or buying the risk that they can't lower permeates then the culture and the way that they operate. Yeah. And something I wanted to bring up too, command leadership in the military is all about risk. We know this, right? We've talked yeah. about this before. The thing that makes this different for me as an Intel Bubba who sits back at Garrison, is they're talking about the literal risk to not only their life, but the life of everybody else in their room that are mm -hmm. going to go and do this thing. Yeah. When I their talk actual to, lives. Yeah. It's it's them. So I think it's a very different lens. Let's talk about medical risk. If a medical professional makes an error, which is a horrible, no good, very bad day, the risk is to their patient. Yeah, which is awful and something that they work very hard to avoid as they should, but it's not their own life. Mm -hmm. When I make an assessment of risk as an Intel Bubba, overwhelmingly it's to, it might be to blue forces, 
but they're not my forces. It's just not yeah. me. It's not me and my friends. Yes, airmen, big A, they're my people. Yes, boots on the ground, those are my people, but it's not as visceral. It's not as yeah. literal, like, I'm going to get in a jet here in an hour and go put all these risk calculations to the test. Yeah. And I think that also drives a lot of the behaviors and activities is that lens, which is very different than most of us in the rest of the Air Force. Yeah, and it makes me think of Dave Grossman and his book on killology, his book on killing, that where he talks about physical distance from the act makes it that much easier for you to engage in the act. So if you're further away from the risk, from the danger, then it obviously is that much easier for you to participate in it. But if, like you said, you're literal, but in the seat, yeah, then that completely changes your interaction with it. Which is fascinating because as Spike was talking about how that leads to a high degree of creativity, you would mm -hmm. think, you would think that the risk that because it's them would lead to a lack of creativity. They've leaned into that and said, absolutely not. As a culture, right. we have to think of a million different ways that we can do this because of the risk. Yep. I love that. Because it's hard, we're going to lean into it. Yeah. Instead of running away. That was definitely a, a moment that I was, you know, proud to wear Air Force on my chest. I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I really like that idea that the creativity that has to come along with it in order to not just survive, but to actually push the envelope and make those yeah. high risk, low frequency things get better at them or buy that risk down or train it out so we can continue to push what's possible. You think about it, just even with technology and the development of the aircraft, in less than 100 years, we went from thinking about flying to not only people on the moon, but sustained Mach 2 flight across the United States. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, holy smokes. <laughs> That's technology driven, but it's also driven by creativity and innovation and how we think about and employ this machine and the, the domain that it created. Yeah. And one thing that I wanted to touch on about how they are able to problem solve, have this high level of creativity is the way that they approach each member of the squadron especially when they get into a debrief setting or in the roll call, those different areas, you know, the airing of grievances. He kept saying that rank comes off, which is such an interesting thing and a great contrary that we need to explore a little bit because rank means something in the military. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. It's there for a very, <laughs> very specific purpose. And yet here they are, the quintessential military unit for the Air Force. And what are they doing to improve? They're taking the rank off to enable them to better problem solve, be more creative, find ways to get to yes. And I am certain that the reason that they are able to do things as well as they can is because they don't let rank get in the way. Yeah. Taking the rank off is really what enables them to be creative like that. Yeah. And I picked up on that as well. It made me think of other points. And this was brought up in other interviews we've done where, especially when talking about the air crew concept, when they get on yeah. the aircraft and there's multiple people, anyone of any rank, if it's not safe to fly, they're going to say so. If rank got in the way of that, how catastrophic would that be? You know, young senior airman sees something that's not right, but knows that he can't bring that up to the captain. You know, that's not okay. We can't have that environment yet. As you mentioned, we recognize the absolute essential nature and function and role that rank plays in our, mm -hmm. in successful operations, in culture, in, you name it. Exactly like you described, it's a contrary. We're not going to be able to solve it here. That friction is probably necessary and important. Yeah, we shouldn't try to solve it. The contrary is what enables the success. Exactly. So just another one of those contraries, you know, we've talked about in that in a very recent episode, uh, you know, the contrary nature to this business of ours. Yeah, I thought that was super interesting. So Colin, you know, there were a number of things in the interview that just really put a smile on my face and got me thinking. Yeah. So I have been a part of a piano burning experience. He mentioned that okay. in his 
discussion about some of the traditions that they have. And it was a rather somber event. So it was while I was deployed to the UK at the annual Battle of Britain mess event. So we had a de Havilland hurricane flyover. That was very cool. You know, Mm -hmm. a World War II aircraft. We had an amazing formal dinner. The Brits can really throw a party. They're very good at that. I've never worn my mess dress as frequently as I did in the UK all the time, formal events. Yeah. Usually you don't deploy with your mess dress. Oh, yeah. No, it, that was an absolute requirement. <laughs> and, you know, so I got to participate in one of those incredible experiences. At the very end of the evening, we had the piano and tied it to exactly as described, right? Like to our fallen comrades. And the other thing was because I'm in Europe, I can go to a pub and look at a ceiling and see all the names of the pilots who were fighting mm-hmm. in the Battle of Britain, who, yeah. who were flying against Germany, and, and see the, the U.S. cemetery at Cambridge and read the names of people who are lost. And, and so it, it's a little bit more visceral because you're there. And so I've been able to touch some of these things that he described. Another thing, I have a call sign. I was named different. I've not been in a fighter squadron again, so it wasn't quite as elaborate as described uh, by Spike, but I don't think you've shared with the audience what your call sign is. I put it in an Instagram post kind of accidentally. (laughs) Yeah. So my call sign is Bean, B-E-A-N, you know, like the the magical fruit or whatever you want to call it. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so that's my call sign, but all of this, it's, that can't be why you're no, called. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. No. That, that would be awesome. That, it's not, <laughs> thankfully. Um, and, th- you know, really quick aside, I love that he mentioned that there's now a red flag, like screening. Like, can you uh-huh. stand up in front of a group of people and say this call sign and it's not super offensive? I don't know if that's new. I'm just a fan of that development. I hope it stays. So, you know, I've done some of these things. I've touched them, kind of like glance by the side had experiences with all this stuff. Yeah, you've been affected by fighter culture without having been in a fighter squadron. Exactly, right? yeah. And you guys talked about this, right? The diffusion of this culture into the Air Force. And yeah. the thing that really I was wondering as I thought about this is, well, what is my community's culture? Mm-hmm. Like you're talking specifically Intel? Yeah, yeah. What's the Intel community culture? I mean, the I see the Intel community is massive it is it's vast i mean way way bigger than just the fighter culture of the air force oh yeah no it's huge 18 departments and agencies across the whole of government Uh, it's it's, there's a lot so but there is an air force intel culture okay and i thought well what is that culture because i can definitely see influences in the fighter culture right influencing ours because we can be stationed and be a part of fighter squadrons tons of them yeah and then what really stood out to me, though, is the next follow-on I question I asked myself is, well, how would I even know what my culture is unless I experience another community's culture? Mm-hmm. I wouldn't even know. And when we were discussing this, Colin, it's like a fish knowing that there's water. They don't know that they're in water. Well, we don't know this. I haven't asked the fish. I don't know if you've had a conversation with one. But the point being, yeah, you're completely covered and surrounded by your own culture. And unless you've been outside of it and experienced another culture, how are you going to know what yours is? And subsequently, how are you going to make judgment calls about what should be or shouldn't be a part of your culture? Right. I loved his description of debriefs. Um, you know, Colin, we've recommended the Fighter Pilot podcast before. Mm-hmm. There are a number of experiences where they talk about debriefing. That is a fantastic culture. I would love for a little bit more of that to be in my culture. It's there more yeah. so than in others. Again, having been in AETC training culture, yep. I have seen that the debrief culture was brought into AETC. My check ride to yep. get qualified as an instructor was tough. It was Not as hard as getting qualified as an intel officer in the briefing aspect, but it was similar. And that came from fighters. And so I've seen the diffusion. It makes me wonder about my own culture, about my own community. But the big take home for me was how important I need to get out of my head and my own culture to learn about others. Well, yeah. I mean, I think I've shared before that innovation, creativity happens at 
the intersections of these disparate things of two different cultures of diverse thinking or or whatever. It's at the contraries where this kind of stuff is made possible. Like what would happen in an Intel squadron if everybody took their rank off for a day? Like what innovation could take place, right? Yeah. You know, if everybody got together in a room for a commander's call and it was a down day or something, like everybody come to discuss this really tough, hairy, scary problem, we all take our rank off or we meet up in civvies or whatever, whatever the mechanism is to remove some of the barriers to conversation and allow some of that creativity to flow. Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, I don't have answers, right? I'm not going to be able to solve this, but. Well, I don't know that you're identifying a problem that needs to be solved. Yeah, no, agree. You're you're just asking the question, Mm -hmm. what is my culture and can I know it without changing my circumstance? Yeah. Changing my view. Yeah. And the follow on step to that, Colin, how on earth am I expected to be a successful leader of multiple communities of multiple cultures unless I know? Yeah. How on earth are you supposed to be a wing commander with an ops group, with support, with logistics, with maintenance, with weather, unless you can successfully integrate aspects of all cultures, if you can't Mm -hmm. successfully navigate the differences, if you can't use a single acronym in one place because you know that it doesn't match their version of that same acronym. Yeah. And expand that. Let's keep going. Let's lead a coalition. If you can't yep. relate to, yeah, if you can't relate to your uh, Lithuanian counterparts or your Italian counterparts, how are you supposed to do that if you've just been completely siloed in your own space, swimming in your own water? You don't know. You got to learn. That was a big like leadership lesson for me. I need yeah. to interact more, learn more, become more informed. Got to do more. Yeah. And listening to this podcast is a good start, right? Because here we're highlighting the issue. We're giving people the opportunity to to hear alternate perspectives from a variety of different career fields, right? So thank you, audience, for tuning in and exposing yourself to something that's outside of yourself. That is a great place to start. But if you are in the Air Force, if you are at a base, you have the opportunity. If you're a, a lieutenant or a captain, you can go to the CGOC you know, the company grade officers council, not that this is an endorsement for the CGOC and we say everybody should rush to it and go participate, but that is an example of a place that you can go to get different perspectives. Or if you have the opportunity, like if you're co-located in the same building with another squadron, walk over there, find a fellow Lieutenant and talk to them, right? Exactly. Go get a different perspective rather than keeping your head down Swimming in your own water, as you put it. I love that expression. (laughs) Yeah. And keeping yourself from getting exposed to different ways of thinking, different ways of problem solving, of different types of opportunities for creativity that may solve the problem that you are coming up against. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, really enjoyed this interview. I think Spike has given us a lot of things to think about. I just loved his tattoo story. That was <laughs> right. fantastic. And and again, right, like so much of what was going on. Where's it, yours, Reed? I, I don't have a tattoo, but boy, I would have been tempted. I got to tell you, just, just right? the opportunity, <laughs> that, that level of just shenanigans just made me smile. It made me smile. And that was kind of like my biggest take home of this whole thing, Colin. This is my culture. I am not a fighter yeah. pilot. I am not in a fighter squadron, but. These are my people. Yeah. I can see parallels. I can see hints. I can see just bits and pieces that have been put into what I do and made me excited. But this is part of who we are. Yeah. And, you know, we've got this big mural. I don't know if it's still there. It was when I left OTS. History makes you smart. Tradition makes you proud. I think there's something to that. I love how, you know, the piano burning is a great example, right? That's a very visceral experience. Let me tell you, seeing, you know, 700 pounds of wood and iron be lit on fire, that, yeah, that's something, but it's what goes behind it. So yes, let's bring in the tradition. Let's bring in the heritage of, hey, Battle of Britain, you know, incredible, important air war turned the tide in World War II, especially when it comes to the air superiority for the allies. But it was about people not coming home. 
Like, what does that mean to you? How does that yeah. feel? So you've got the history, then you've got the heritage, and you've got it all that kind of comes together in this thing that makes up culture. And yeah, really great. I really enjoyed having Colonel Jorowitz come and share with us. Yeah, for sure. You can see how culture enables strategy or that culture eats strategy for lunch. You know, the Peter Drucker quote there, the culture of who we are as airmen is central to everything that we do. And as you said, it is critical for us as leaders to understand what our culture is and how to change it, how to be creative about the problems and solutions that we're facing in order to enable that culture, make it better, make it inclusive for as many people as possible so that we can accomplish the mission because that's what it's all about. Yeah, totally agree. Anything else, Colin, before we wrap up today? Huge thanks to Spike. Could not have had this discussion without him. He was the right person at the right moment, at the right time. And he's a really great airman, great representative of the fighter culture. He is a compliment to the Air Force for sure. And it was a pleasure to have him on. Yeah, goodness knows, Colin, you and I could not do an episode on fighter culture <laughs> without <laughs> bringing somebody from that community. Yeah, I totally right. agree. Really excited we could share this with you all today. That's all I've got. So thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Commission Ed.